Hello there, everyone. Today we're going to be doing something a little different. Today's going to be the inaugural episode in what I think is going to be a recurring series in which I compare and contrast movies that have been adapted from books. Uh, now, it makes a lot of sense for filmmakers to want to adapt books into movies because it's uh, an established intellectual property. There's a good number of movies out there that have been adapted from books, and this makes a lot of sense because uh, when you adapt a novel into a movie, you're dealing with an established story. Uh, it's a property that's been around, it's got some legs, people respond to it, and you, you can see that. You also have the added benefit of the fact that a lot of the marketing is already done. People are familiar with the story, they know what to expect, uh, some of the advertising is kind of done, and there's already that built-in audience. People who enjoy the book are probably going to go see the movie. And of course, if the book is already in the public domain, as some of them are, you don't have to pay for copyright fees. Uh, you just have to pay somebody to adapt it into a screenplay. So there's a bonus right there. Of course, a book and a movie are two different ways of telling a story, uh, and there's going to be some, some changes, some alterations you have to make when doing an adaptation. But that's not necessarily going to make one weaker or stronger than the other. It's just interesting to note the differences between the two. So for the inaugural episode of this series, I'm going to start off by talking about Dune the novel and Dune the movie. Regardless of which story we're talking about, it's still the same basic plot. It's a science fiction story about a guy named Paul Atreides, who's the son of a duke. His royal family gets overthrown, and he has adventures among a desert-dwelling people known as the Fremen, in which he aspires and achieves to greatness. Frank Herbert's Dune was first published in 1965, and it has remained one of the favorite science fiction novels out there. And it's pretty easy to see why. Rich storytelling, a very in-depth and detailed world, and it explores some interesting ideas. Uh, the ideas of the growth of the human mind, the evolution, and the potential uh, human consciousness can achieve. And a lot of people respond to it. And aside from that, it's just a really good story. Of course, when you adapt a novel that's almost 500 pages long to a, the big screen, you have to make some changes, some alterations. And it's interesting when we look at the movie, how they made those adaptations, uh, what changes they made, uh, what they cut, uh, because they did leave a lot out. Uh, there are some characters, there are some subplots that don't really get mentioned in the, the, the movie because... Again, they just don't have time to. But for me, one of the most interesting things to look at is not what they left out, but it's, in fact, what they added in. And what I'm talking about specifically is the weirding modules in the movie. Uh, and these were the things they wear on their hands, uh, and it's a way to weaponize sound, and it gives the Fremen an upper hand in the battles they fight. And there's no mention of these in the book. Uh, in the book, they talk about something known as the weirding way of battle, but it's no sort of technological advance. It's actually kind of described as like a heightened form of martial arts. There are a couple of reasons why the filmmakers might have chosen to, to have done this. Uh, one is it adds a little more science fiction element to the movie because at the point where uh, the action kind of starts taking off, it almost doesn't feel like a science fiction movie anymore. It's just kind of like this weird uh, desert adventure. So it adds a little something for the audience to, to recognize it as a science fiction story. And two, there's probably no good way to really illustrate a, or show on film a heightened form of martial arts. It's easier just to make it a technological achievement. I think it takes a little something out of the story, uh, but I understand why they did it. Of course, when you cut out so much from the pages, uh, you end up losing some stuff. And what I think suffered the most in the transition was the sense of intrigue we have in the books. Uh, everybody, all the major characters in the, in the novels, they're very much focused on plots and schemes and the political machinations that are going on kind of behind the scenes. And they're very savvy about this. And you really get a sense for that in the book, uh, just from the very personal level to the very, you know, political, uh, galactically political level, where everybody's thinking about two or three steps ahead and they've got, you know, plots within plots and they use the term wheels within wheels. And you really get a sense for that sort of intrigue in the in the book, but you don't really get a sense of that in the film. The film's really an adventure story, and I think it suffers a little bit because of that. Uh, it's still an entertaining movie, but you lose a lot of what kind of made Dune, Frank Herbert's Dune, an interesting story. One of the prime examples of this is the fact that in the novel, Paul and Jessica are actually using the Fremen spiritual beliefs about the Mahdi uh, for their own advancement. They're manipulating these beliefs for their political gain, uh, for their survival. 
and to you know, target the Fremen uh, against their enemies of the Harkonnen. Now there is some gray area for this because in the book they talk about how these Fremen beliefs have been nurtured and cultivated by the Reverend Mothers uh, in line with their own breeding program, which Paul is part of. So it's not quite so black and white as they're just manipulating these people's religious beliefs. There's actually some truth to why they can get manipulated these ways. Uh, but there's less of that in the movie. In the movie it's very much a kind of pseudo-spiritual uh, religious experience and we get the feeling that Paul really is this kind of uh, super being whereas in the, the novel again it's more of a, a genetic growth as opposed to some sort of godlike power. For me the thing that was immediately apparent uh, when you start comparing the, the book and the movie is that the book is very personable. When we read the novel, it all takes place at a very individual level. Uh, a lot of the interactions are on a very small scale. Uh, we see a lot of dialogue and we see a lot of interactions that are between two or three people or small groups or something like that. We don't get the large scale nature of uh, what's going on because the focus, I think, is very intently on the, the people. And I say that because Frank Herbert's philosophy on this was the, the danger of putting huge power into uh, one person's hands. Uh, even a really good person isn't perfect and the way he emphasizes that is again by focusing on the individual and not on the large-scale events. Now in the movie the filmmakers went about this a different way. There's very much an epic feel to the story. Uh, we get a lot of large shots, lots of people running around. We actually see the battle sequences. Uh, we never see them in the novel. We get the lead up to them and the aftermath, but we never actually see the battles. We never actually take place in the battles. And again, I think this was very intentionally done by Frank Herbert when he wrote the novel, and again, very intentionally done by the filmmakers when they wanted to show this, because they wanted to show the epic nature, which is why Paul comes across as a godlike figure, and we get the sweeping battle scenes, because it's an epic story, whereas Frank Herbert really wanted it to be a very personal story. So I think it's very interesting in the same basic story, uh, we have just two different ways of looking at the story, the, the epic nature or the personal nature of it. Uh, again, film versus novel, epic versus personal. And it was very deliberately done by both sets of storytellers, the filmmakers and the director David Lynch or the author Frank Herbert. Now the Sci-Fi Channel did make a mini-series of Frank Herbert's scene a few years ago, and I think it's a good halfway point between the novel and the feature film uh, because Obviously, it's longer. They took about six hours to do it, so they could tell more of the story, invest a little bit more time in the characters and the subplots. Uh, but the production value wasn't as high, so sometimes it looks a little cheesy. Uh, some of the special effects are actually better because it's about 30 years newer, uh, and frankly, some of the special effects in the old feature film are dated. So in the miniseries, they actually stayed closer to the, the source material. Their adaptation wasn't as liberal as the feature film was which I respect, and they also were able to kind of merge the personal and epic nature of the story a little bit better. Uh, you actually got to see some of the, the epic qualities, those big battles that were lacking in the novel, which would have been more interesting. Uh, but you also got kind of the political intrigue and the small interpersonal nature that the feature film kind of lacked at some points. So while the miniseries has its flaws, I think it's, uh, it's a good halfway point between the two, two ways of telling a story. So there we go. That is my interpretation of Dune the novel versus Dune the movie versus Dune the miniseries. And what I think are interesting about the differences between the two or three. Now generally I'm of the mind that you should read the book before seeing the movie. In this case I think it really helps if you do it that way because you can understand a lot more what's happening in the movie if you've read the book uh, because it lays that groundwork that sometimes you, you miss in the movie. Uh, but either one's a good experience um, and if you've got the time and you haven't seen the miniseries go ahead and invest in that as well. So if you've read the one or watched the other go ahead and leave some comments down below so I can see what your thoughts are on the subject because uh, I'm always interested to see those. Uh, hit the subscribe button if you want to and until next time, keep doing what you do.